G'day everyone, welcome back. Um, we've got Slido happening uh, on the website, so please uh, send in any questions uh, tonight and, and we've got a team of people who are able to answer your questions. And um, got a great pleasure to present Chris Staples to you. Chris has been in the public health unit for about 20 years and before that she was with the Division of GPs, before it was called the PHN, Division of GPs. Chris is amazing and she's going to retire in a month or two. So this is um, quite a uh, monumentous occasion for us and just wonderful to have Chris with us. And Chris has had a very colourful health history in the last few years and the fact that she's here and strong and amazing is just absolutely fantastic. And I know she loves talking to all you guys out there. So um, uh, enjoy this incredible presentation from Chris. Hi. Thanks, everybody. This is very exciting. They don't let me out very often. Um, and thank you for those kind words, Patrick. And indeed, I've been working in immunisation for about 32 years um, when we used to yeah, do the old clunky things for the Australian Immunisation Register, remember? Well, even before there was a register. So I'll get on with my slides. Um, and this is a photo I took just to remind us... <laughs> that this wet weather continues and I'm, I'm, my thoughts are so much with these poor people experience these incredible floods and um, also the terrible problems in the Ukraine. It's sort of looking at the news is very distressing at the moment. So hopefully we'll um, give you something nice to think about tonight as, as you're um, having your little wines or whatever. So vaccine storage. I'm talking about vaccine storage and, and a few other things. And you've heard this a million times before, but we need to remember we have a whole stack of new staff working in the immunisation field. So bear with me if this is quite boring for you um, because we are covering um, experience, very experienced to very little experience. So some of this is very repetitive. So the main, main thing is why are we concerned about vaccine storage management? Why is it so important? And as you saw in my opening slide, is if we don't care for our vaccines, they're not going to protect our patients. The cold chain is storing your vaccines. It used to be between two and eight degrees, but as you know now with COVID vaccines, it varies a lot, but f mainstream, Vaccination storage, GP land, hospitals, it's two and eight degrees at all times, okay? So why do we need to make sure this happens? We don't want people to be vaccinated with an ineffective product thinking they thinking that they're immune and they're not, okay? So we need to make sure it's effective. Very currently, we know that vaccines are often in short supply, Okay, and they're also expensive, so we don't want to waste them. And professional accountability, it's very embarrassing um, if you have to ring a patient up and say, sorry, that vaccine wasn't stored correctly, we're going to have to revaccinate you, and particularly when that's a child, okay? It's not a comfortable position to be in. So where do we go to for help? There are so many um, resources out there. So there's a, a new edition of the Cold Chain Toolkit for immunisation providers. Make sure that you are really... Um, comfortable with the knowledge that's inside that. There's the National Vaccine Storage Guidelines, um, and it, which includes the Safe Vaccine Storage Checklist, which we'll go through in a minute. And of course, there's our wonderful website, okay? We've been trying to Google our website tonight for a search, and it's not impossible. So once you find it, just make it a favourite. Pin it to your desktop, whatever you have to do, but just try and keep it there. And I'll come back to that later um, when I show you some other things that are on there. So why do we keep talking about vaccine storage? Because usually we get it right, don't we? Look at those labels everywhere and the min maxes hanging off everywhere. And sometimes we get it wrong, okay? So that's why we have to keep talking about it. You get new staff. There's a high turnover of staff at the moment. Everyone has to be educated in what needs to be done constantly. 
So here's this vaccine storage checklist that I was talking about. And look, it's another PPE. I was so excited when I found that. People, processes and equipment, OK? Another PPE. So the first thing you need is equipment, really good equipment. And this means a purpose-built vaccination fridge, right? Nothing else is really uh, acceptable. So then we need our monitoring equipment, and I'll go through that a little bit more in a minute. And then the processes, so vaccine delivery. How do you receive your vaccine? Who's accountable? Does everyone in your practice know that once a vaccine box arrives, you have to be notified straight away that these have to be put in the fridge? And then staff education. Uh, there's a really great uh, uh, vaccine storage and cold chain management module available, made available on the New South Wales Health website. That should be done by every person who has responsibilities for vaccine storage. So the other education that needs to happen is for everyone who can come in contact with your fridge and your power supply. So that might mean maintenance people, it might mean cleaners, it could be, it, it is your admin people. So everyone should have education and everyone who has a higher degree of, edu of um, access to those vaccines should do that uh, cold chain management module that's available on the New South Wales Health website. So, um, Let's go down. This is the annual vaccine storage self-audit. That comes in the strive for five. You should be doing this every year. It says annual, that's what the guidelines say, do this every year. In addition for H&E, LHD, or public facilities, uh, there's an annual QAS audit required, okay? So monitoring equipment. It is, and has been for a long time, mandatory to have continuous logging of the vaccines in your fridge. So that's a computerised logger. They're getting very clever these days. They're um, web-based. There's web-based ones. And there's our old, beautiful old favourite tiny tag and log tag. They still all work really well, but you have to have them. That's the main thing. So up the top there you can see, make sure that the interval is every five minutes. You need to be checking that. Don't just assume, because when we get reports of cold chain breaches, we are looking at your loggings to see what they're configured at. So every five minutes, and they must be um, lo uh, programmed to run continuously so that they don't fill up and then stop, because invariably they stop when you actually need that information. It's mandatory to download that data weekly. So as someone here said, don't just download it, check it at the same time. Check, have a system in, in place. So previously I said that people are one of the, the important factors. The best way to manage your vaccine storage is to have one dedicated person in your facility who's responsible for vaccine storage and a backup, okay? So when you download this information, please make it available to everyone. Everyone in your practice needs to know where that is. So you, the main person may be away and the back, backup person may be on sick leave. If you have a cold chain breach and your admin person rings, they need to know how to get that data file to us. Educate them, show them, tell them where it's saved so that they can um, confidently send it to us. So apart from a, uh, a logger which you service and check accuracy every 12 months, you then need a min-max thermometer as in addition. Okay, we have a lot of problems with people saying, why do I, on earth do I need a min-max thermometer when I've got this fancy computer one? Because we don't trust technology, that's why. We want as many available um, de uh, devices that we can collaborate with if there is a breach, right? So a min-max 
is we want a battery operated one and you need to have one for every every fridge and every uh, alternative cold storage so in like an esky for when you're transporting okay so there's an inbuilt one in your fridge we would prefer it if you have a separate one that you can move around in your fridge and take with you if you move vaccines um, we've had people have uh, had blackouts and they've moved their vaccines and taken their logger with them, a portable logger, taken the eskies, taken the logger, and I said, Where, where's your readings for you when you've transported the vaccines? And they said, oh, we put the logger in the glove box of the car. So just think about what you're doing and the fact that we need to know what temperature your vaccines are at at all times. The, this is just an example of a how to plot a graph. Uh, we've had lots of incidents where people are only plotting current temperature, absolute waste of time. We need all three temperatures. You need the minimum, the maximum and the current temperature and that obviously only needs to be on the days when your practice is open. The same with your logger, you must change the battery each 12 months and uh, check the accuracy. And the, you check the accuracy of your loggers by doing an ice slurry test. Uh, that explains there how we do it, uh, put ice in a cup, get your uh, min max down to zero degrees, check labels, uh, put labels on the back to say the ice test was done on this date and the battery was changed on that date. Now, stickers are really important. You saw our photo of our fridge, uh, had stickers everywhere. Um, so many incidences of people turning off power points, possibly because it was on an extension cord and, and was not near the fridge, but turning off a power point, say, to, to plug in uh, some other device, OK? Power, uh, stickers everywhere. I actually like that red sticker there. I put it over the top of the plug. Not above it, not beside it. I put it on top of the plug because it's amazing how you can learn to ignore um, messages. Okay, so fridge, PowerPoint and meter box. Don't turn the power off. This is the, um, the graph that New South Wales Health has developed. If you're a Hunter New England facility, you have to use it and it's really a good um, graph to use. Don't, I've, we're still seeing people who have just got columns and they write the temperatures in a column. You've got to graph it. It has to be visual on your fridge so that whoever goes to get a vaccine out can see that those um, vaccines have been stored at an appropriate temperature. Okay? They're readily available. There's um, on the, the Commonwealth website. That down the bottom is a freeze monitor. So make sure that when the vaccines are delivered that people are checking to make sure that they haven't been outside the cold chain during that delivery. Okay, so reporting a cold chain breach. Vaccine storage records need to be stored as a clinical record on a common drive in appropriately named folder. So, example, vaccine fridge temperature recordings. These include scanned, manually recorded temperature graphs, vaccine delivery charts, as well as computer logins, maintenance reports, etc. Because when you have a breach, we need to find out where all this information is. So have a standardised place where this is stored, all of it. Vaccine store, vaccination storage records are a clinical record because they help us decide whether that vaccine was viable when your patient was vaccinated. So deciding if vaccines can be kept in the event of a cold chain breach requires careful consideration by the experts <laughs> at the Public Health Unit and um, we need the time out of zone data. This is made easy if we can look at your logger file. And so what we're going to do now is I want to show you how to fill out a cold chain breach reporting form and we just have to swap over to the website so that we can, I'll go on live and show you how to fill it out, okay? 
All right, just bear with us, everyone. We'll just get this sorted out. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is our brilliant website, as I said. Uh, there is a lot of information here, and we really, um, you know, we will refer you to here if you're um, asking questions that we know are available, answered on here. So the education one, people have been asking tonight where this webinar will be available. Go to that education link there and the webinars will be available there. All the old To The Point newsletters are there. Information for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are there. Um, our free clinic and school vaccination information. But this one here, information for health professionals. Um, is the go-to for all good things. So, link to the immunisation handbook up there. Wonderful, wonderful links there. But here, if you want to report a cold chain breach, every time we want you to go to our website. We don't want you to get an old form because they change all the time. We want you to go here. So. It says in red, John, John Fazer, our wonderful um, IT person, said, I think I need to make this really bold for you. So there it is. And what we're saying is we need this as a fillable um, PDF. So you download it from our website, and once you get it... Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. We could do a dance while we're waiting... Did everyone see that amazing fire in Newcastle today? Right next to a fuel storage facility. <laughs> um, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, come on, it's so slow. There it is. Okay, so once you get it, you go to, this. in this case, it's download and you save it, okay? Save it on your desktop, wherever, wherever is easy. You save it first, and then you fill out the saved one. And that's important, and I'm telling you why, because we're lazy, right? Once you do that, see here, we just have to drop this down and select the appropriate um, advice for you. Otherwise, we have to go and cut and paste it, and it's just annoying, okay? So, go and do that. Now, um, here it tells you clearly we need to know if your, how many times your vaccines have been expo exposed to uh, a, a breach. So, ones that have never been exposed before, this is the first exposure, you'll put in a number... Um, and no, there won't be enough room for that, so we'll have one. And if you've got ones that have been exposed to a breach, you put that in a bracket, okay? So you then save it and attach it to an email and send it back to us, okay? So now I'm going to go back to our, our slides. Show I one can of them. Yep. Yep, so we'll extend. Mm. Yeah, and we'll go from the current slide. Lovely. Okay. So, thank you. Um, yeah, so fill it in. Completes section one and two completely. Fill it all in. We need to know all the information. You, just, you can't just put little bits in. We need it all. Um, only complete section three if it's a fridge malfunction. And then in section four, as detailed here, we need your number of vaccines. And then... The final part is tells you what attachments you need to send. Please make sure you send all those attachments. And then there's a section for public health use only where we will tell you the actions required and we attach that to an email that will fully um, tell you what to do with your vaccines 
what to do with your discarded ones, what to do with the ones that you retain, and that's all about uh, labelling them. If you get to retain them, you label them with the date of the breach so we can count up breaches, okay? So, take home to-do list. I think this is Jody's. Rotate your stock. Ensure you are maintaining your equipment. So your fridge gets maintained, your data logger and your min maxes and check the accuracy. Um, ensure your data logger is set for five minutes and run continuously. Ensure no vaccines are stored on the floor of your fridge and always in their original packaging. Ensure you and other staff know how to download your data logger Sorry, download should be one word, but anyway. Your logger and how to attach this file to an email. Complete your annual strive for five audit or quas for H&E facilities and consider getting an extra fridge if you need additional storage, especially the flu season, you've got COVID vaccines, you've got flu vaccines. You may need another fridge. Don't be like our first photo, Okay. Any new fridge has to be logged for 20, 72 hours before you use it. So um, I'm going to go on to Proda now. So post any questions you need on the Slido and we can deal with those. So Proda, that's um, provided digital access and you would all be into this now. There's our old way of getting on to the Australian Immunisation Register. And there's the new way, and doesn't that do your head in? You thought the old one was hard. The proto, like, what is it, 10 minutes, I think, if you're inactive and you're gone. So why have we moved to this? Because I think we're having quite a few privacy breaches before with shared passwords and things like that. So this one will do a timestamp of everyone who um, goes on to the website, OK? So why are we doing this now? There's the um, AIR Act, Australian Immunisation Register Act 2015, in the amendment, which requires that all um, vaccines are recorded within 10 days. Excuse that slide, it's not finished, so I'll go on to the next one. Yeah, so what we're also saying is if you get someone from overseas who presents to you with their records, it is actually your responsibility to put their records onto the AIR. Sorry, guys, it's a big job sometimes, but that's written clearly in this um, AIR Act um, because they require those records like uh, citizens in Australia do. So now I'm going to go on my travels, show you a few old photos. And as you can see here, I've been everywhere. So photos here are from Mungandai, Tenterfield, Glen Innes, uh, Urala, Vegetable Creek, Tamworth, Manila, Wee War, and um, Armadale. It's been a wonderful time I've had here. Down the bottom there you can see the old-fashioned way we used to do the school consent cards and had to send them to Sydney. That's all changed now. And we've now gone digital with our handbook, which was hard for some people to, to deal with, but there's also a, an app store uh, where you can have it on your phone, which is really handy as well. There's some of our really old books that will show your age, which one of those handbooks that you remember. Some more photos. Jody loves T-shirts. There they are with their free flu shot today photo. Hopefully some of you guys might recognise yourself here. And then... Um, this year, I'm going to indulge myself in a minute in some of my favourite stuff, but that's me there. Um, I had a stem cell transplant in the end of 2017 and this is now my sort of bit of passion is vaccination for immunocompromised people, so hemopoietic stem cell transplant recipients. And we're getting 
We're getting more and more, and we're getting a lot of questions, so it actually is useful for other people besides me. Um, you have a whole stack of vaccines. I have to have a shout out to my GP and my wonderful GP nurse. They've vaccinated me with so many vaccines. It's quite a, a schedule and it's really serious business to make sure these people are protected. Um, I'm a bit on the warpath uh, about the fact that some of these vaccines are not free for stem cell transplant patients, so I'll continue to advocate for that once I've retired. And the issue here is that, this is all in the handbook, but there talks about live vaccines after two years. My haematologist won't let me have any live vaccines ever, so don't assume that what's written in the handbook is gospel, when there's specialists involved in care of patients, you always defer to them. They can, for the first time in our life, overrule um, whatever we think, OK? So um, resources for immunocompromised people is the Australian Immunisation Handbook, of course. But the Melbourne Vaccination Education Centre produced a really super guideline um, as you can see, post-chemotherapy and hemopoietic stem cell transplant immunisation guideline for children. Um, the NCs fact sheet for meningococcal vaccines. I, I love this one. We found it because it actually is NCs, which is, you know, very important. And it says that Bexero is free for stem cell transplant patients. So when you want to give a Bexero for a stem cell transplant patient, just say you were referring to that guideline, OK? And then there's the, um, the, the table is in the handbook, clearly shows you uh, what to give. And then um, Zoster is my other pet thing because I was immunosuppressed, I got Zoster, it's not fun and I have permanent um, post-hepatic um, neuropathy and that's not fun either. And so um, Zoster is a, a big issue and lots of questions tonight about a shingles vaccine and the new shingles vaccine, which is not pro uh, uh, free. It's not free for anyone anywhere, so you, it's not a matter of reading the right piece of paper. Um, if you're in doubt... Read that fact sheet, it's got a lot of information, um, but if in doubt about the, uh, the um, immune response, the immune condition of some patient, don't give them a live Zoster vaccine, okay? Uh, refer it to NSWIS. NSWIS is a fantastic uh, resource apart from, uh, you know, ringing us here. But I'm going to um, just go on to a couple of sites that I think are, are just super, and I'll just have to swap over again. I don't want to come back. I've finished. Okay. All right, nice. <laughs> Two seconds. And that one. Yes. Okay. So someone asked me if um, what do you give? They're still confused with Numavax and the Prevnar 13. So we're just going to use this amazing tool called Numo Smart Tool and um, you don't, it's not linked to anyone, you can put anyone's name in, but we need a proper date um, of birth to give the correct age and so we're going to get someone who's 70, okay? So this is the 70 year old and their scenario was they weren't Torres, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander they don't have any risk conditions, but have a look at the risk conditions. Okay, these are all the risk conditions for pneumococcal disease. Okay, so this one doesn't have any. So I'm doing this scenario for someone who uh, had a question tonight. And have they received any previous pneumococcal vaccine? Yes, this one had a pneumovax 23 at the age of 65. Okay, so click that and go next. Confirm all the details. Yep, we've got a 70-year-old patient and no risk condition has had a Pneumovax 23. So what it says is due now is a Prevnar 13 and it gives you the gaps. 
That's it, full stop, end of story. You don't have to think any further. So if you've got someone who's really complex, it, it, it is so good. It, you don't have to think because it is a little comp complex these days. Okay, so make sure everyone's doing that. It's on our website. And the other one, so there it is, uh, New Mouse Mart 2. And the other one is Spleen Australia, which a lot of uh, uh, blood cancer patients have functional asplenia. So this is the best website to assist for that. And it um, gives you the best flow chart. And you've, I've shown you a million times before, but it's one of my favourite uh, websites, so you can go there to Spleen Australia and um, and find out what needs to be done with these patients. So I want to say thank you very much. I've had a wonderful time working for um, Hunter New England. I've had so many name changes of places I've worked for, but it's basically all been in immunisation. And um, I will be very sad to go, but if you ever hear me knocking on the door when I'm up in Tenterfield or Bogabilla or Mungandai. Um, it's because I'm passing through and want to say hello because I've made so many wonderful friends, friends with my time here um, and I will miss you all. So thank you very much, okay? If you could just stay there for one minute. If you could just stay there for one minute. I did see that picture of you and Kerry Chant. <laughs> but we all know who your real love is. So as well as all the beautiful, beautiful messages you're going to see when you get back to your desk, mm. I contacted Julia Gillard and invited her to come and see you. She totally does things like that. To give a talk to us about mental health mm. and to thank us all for the amazing work we're doing. Oh, and by the way, my mate States is retiring. Julia got back to me and said, I'm really sorry I'm in Geneva. I can't come to Wall's End. But if you could give this to your friend Christine... It's a signed photo from Julia Gillard saying, Dear Christine Staples, thank you for your dedication, Julia Gillard. It's, <laughs> it's legit. Oh, <laughs> so, oh, us, I'm, I'm just thrilled because... Us and sorry, Julia will miss you saying. terribly. <laughs> oh, she, honestly, she's um, someone I really you're doing on. something nice. <laughs> wow, I'm just thrilled. Jodie invites everybody. All the time. These are experts from America. She wonders why they won't come over and see us. But she keeps trying and she's awesome. And, yeah, I, I'm just so thrilled. Thank you so much. And goodbye. See ya. Thanks, Chris. That's fabulous. Um, so there's a wonderful career to be had in public health. Uh, and immunisation is a great complement to any, any career. There's a lot of... Um, young registered nurses that have done immunisation training and they've been giving COVID vaccines uh, in the last 12 months. And immunisation is a great um, companion to anything else that you do. So if you're a midwife or work in aged care, work with kids, no matter what you do, giving vax, all those people need vaccines. It's a great uh, accompaniment to anything that you do. Uh, so I'm just going to run through some COVID vaccines, then talk a little bit about Q fever and then the current influenza vaccine, uh, and then we'll finish up. Uh, we may have time for a Q&A at the end, but maybe not. Um, but keep your questions going uh, anyway and, um, and, and write some messages to Chris. Um, so the COVID vaccines, this is a schema from uh, Katie Flanagan from Launceston. Um, and, and there's lots of different ways to make a vaccine. But what you're trying to do is stimulate the immune system to recognise that spike protein, that famous spike protein. So there's different ways of doing it. So this is... One way is to create the protein external to the body and then inject the protein. So this is what we do with Novavax. So Novavax, I have it on good authority, like Novacastrian is, is, is Newcastle vaccine. Um, and it's very similar to the Gardasil vaccine. So it's a traditional vaccine. So there's been some people that have been worried about the mRNA vaccines and they've been waiting for a more traditional vaccine. Now, the Novavax is just available in the last month. Some of you will have it in your practices and it's available for a primary course. Uh, so how it's made is that the DNA that codes for the spike proteins put into a little... Um, 
bacillovirus, and then that this is external to our body, this is how the um, vaccine's made, then that's put into a cell, which happens to be a moth cell. Um, and then that DNA then comes out, so this is like done in a big vat, that comes out and the DNA then in the cell nucleus obviously uh, will stimulate a messenger RNA which will then stimulate the ribosome to make the copy of the spike protein. They're expressed on the outside of that cell and then they're gathered together. So they clump together just like they do on the surface of a coronavirus. Then they're sort of centrifuged and gathered and it's just that copy of the spike protein that we inject with the, um, the Novavax vaccine. Then as you inject it, your dendritic cell picks it up, takes it to your lymph nodes, the T helper cells then pick it up, and then you start to make, uh, recognise it and, and, and make antibodies which are presented to the B cells. So that's the Novavax. So it's a very uh, a traditional way, it's, as I say, it's the same way we make the Gardasil vaccine for HPV, the famous Ian Fraser vaccine. Uh, so if you've got some people being nervous about mRNA vaccines, the, the Novavax may be for them. Um, but the mRNA has really changed everything. It's absolutely extraordinary. So the mRNA, it's the messenger RNA, and you would have heard many people talking about the recipe book analogy, and it's quite good. So the DNA, obviously we all have our coding from our parents in our DNA, and every cell in our body, our, our, our kidneys, our muscles, are all encoded in the DNA. The DNA sits in the nucleus and the ribosome is in the cytoplasm of the cell and the ribosome makes all the proteins. But how does the message get from the DNA to the ribosome? And it's the messenger RNA. So it takes a little bit of the message from the DNA, takes it outside the nucleus and then to, to the um, uh, cytoplasm where the ribosome will make the protein. So that's done by transcription uh, inside the nucleus, then that message for the messenger RNA, it's a bit like a message stick in the old days when uh, message sticks were used. Um, and then that goes outside into the cytoplasm to the ribosome and it runs through the ribosome a bit like a ticker tape and then gives that message and the ribosome will then build the proteins and all the bodies in our, in our all the cells in our body are, are made that way. So this is just giving the recipe books, like a page out of a recipe book uh, and, and then that's injected in, and then you've got the book, so it doesn't have anything to do with our, with our nucleus. So some people were worried about DNA and the vaccines interfering with DNA. That's not the case. So just in case you missed it, the Moderna uh, company, the first name is M, and the last three letters RNA, so mRNA is all they make. So we inject the mRNA. Now, the mRNA, to work properly, it's got to slip into the cell, so it's put in a little fatty capsule, but that's quite delicate. So that's that schema at the top there. There's a little fatty capsule with the mRNA. The mRNA, it's very, very delicate, hence the incredible cold chain. So these things are transported. Um, they're not made here in Australia yet. Uh, they're transported from overseas at minus 70, and then after they're thawed out, they go to your practice, and you've got them for a month. So the timing and the accurate labelling is really, really important and they're very very delicate so this is we don't want to shake it when we're making it up uh, then it's injected in there's the ribosome on the lower schema there um, making the uh, copies of the spike protein really clever technology and then off to the um, to the left uh, to the B cell where obviously antibodies are made and off to the right T helper cells where you get cellular immunity built up. So because you get cellular immunity and humoral immunity or antibodies, you get quite good immunity. It works really, really well. But that page out of the recipe book doesn't seem to last very long. Hence that third dose is really, really important. So you get really good protection for a few months then you need that reminder. Now in the future when there's less COVID around, we'll probably need that reminder, booster dose less often, probably um, maybe annually. Uh, so the mRNA, very, very delicate, and there's really not much in this vaccine. Some people are really worried about what's in vaccine. So there's four fats that make up that fatty capsule. Um, there's the active ingredient, the uh, mRNA, the fats are things that we know very well, things like cholesterol. Then there's just a few acid stabilizers, salts and water. So they're very, very simple. So you've got to treat them very, very well when you've got them in your practice. Um, but you, people don't really don't need to worry what's in them. They're very simple. But you're thinking, wow, 
that message RNA, you've coded it to make the spike protein, but that could make anything. And that's exactly the case. So this technology, which has come all this way with COVID because of the huge investment, very, very interesting, isn't it? Like people start to die in New York, London and Rome. We put this huge investment in. Kids have been dying from malaria in North Africa for years. No investment in that. Um, but this huge investment and then... So we can make any protein, possibly. So you think about uh, a lot of diseases where there's missing proteins, the obvious one, haemophilia. It's theoretically possible in this paper uh, in molecular therapy uh, talks about that you'd be able to make an mRNA which will code your cells to be able to make factor eight. So there's lots and lots of exciting medicine ahead on the mRNA, not just vaccines. So vaccines here are the vanguard of a whole new lot of medicine. So the Moderna was just provisionally um, uh, approved for children uh, two weeks ago by the TGA. Uh, so that's two doses, 28 days apart. Now, this is a lower dose for kids between 6 and 11, uh, a lower dose. It's half the uh, dose for people over 12. And it has provisional um, approval. Uh, and now part of that provisional approval is a plan for ongoing marketing. Now, the astute amongst you will realise that the children's Pfizer vaccine, which is the main one we've been using, is for 5 up to 11, whereas the Moderna is only for 6 up to 11. So the only way to vaccinate a 5-year-old is with the Pfizer vaccine. Now, the Pfizer have colour-coded them. So the kids one is orange, the adult one is purple, and apparently there's a grey top one as well coming sometime um, that doesn't need dilution. Uh, so the kids for 5 to 11, uh, it's, it's a third of the adult dose uh, and it's 0.2 of a mil. So this is a different strength. So different vials, different strengths. So it's really important that we don't make errors. And part of this tonight is getting you to have really good, high-quality immunisation practice. People aren't going to rock up and have a vaccine if you're not keeping a cold chain like Chris was saying or if you don't know the right vaccines like... Um, Sharon and Rebecca and Jody have been saying. So this quality practice is really important, which for authorised nurse immunisers, why you're required to do an update every year, and we've tried to broaden it um, to make it very general so that you get lots of um, uh, uh, benefit out of this. Now, a lot of people worry. They say it's a provisional registration. Why don't they fully register it? Are they worried about something? Is there something they don't know? And this worries people. But the provisional... Um, registration is the TGA's business as usual. So the TGA makes sure that the um, phase one, two and three of the studies are okay and then they have to have a plan for phase four monitoring, which is post-marketing monitoring, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it's still a full review of the vaccine in terms of efficacy and safety. And then it puts into place for two years, then the company's got to provide more information than another provisional for two years, and then it's two years again, so that's six years of a provisional, and then it gets um, uh, fully registered. But this is business as usual. It doesn't mean it's been rushed. Now, in America, they also have an emergency provision. We don't have that in Australia. The FDA have that. Um, but some people are really nervous about the vaccine. So this is really, really important. Um, so some people are quite nervous about the vaccines and a lot of the nervousness comes from people who perceive they've had a vaccine injury. So this is a picture from the paper a few weekends ago, the guy on the left protesting, um, saying my son was injured by vaccines. And on the right-hand side, a few years ago, there was a Danish documentary about young women who perceived they had neurological damage from the Gardasil vaccine. A documentary maker, a journalist, put them together, made a documentary that got shown in a few countries around the world. And you can see that's Danish um, uh, data on, on the graph there, uh, showing that the rates of HPV vaccination really dropped off in, in, in young women um, after that documentary. So these are young women who now, you know, may have cervical cancer later on, something we can completely prevent with a simple, safe vaccine. Uh, so these uh, young women uh, thought they had re complex regional pain syndrome or POTS, uh, so their uh, uh, neurological diagnosis. Now, it is possible that they did have some effect after the vaccine and they weren't looked after very well and then they feel aggrieved uh, and then they think that the vaccines damaged them. So looking after people after the vaccines, not just making sure your cold chain's right and you give the right person the right vaccine, you've got to look after someone afterwards. So if they come back to you and say, hey, doc, um, or hey, sister, um, hey, sister, <laughs> uh, then um, uh, yeah, this... 
this this thing has damaged me, then really take it seriously. Uh, and Jody and and Rebecca have set up an amazing system of adverse event. Um, uh, monitoring and making sure that people are really looked after. So we really want you to report any adverse events. We don't want people to think they've been vaccine injured. They probably haven't. It hasn't been investigated. It hasn't been reported. Now, in the Public Health Act, um, you've got to notify all sorts of infectious diseases uh, and notifying an adverse event after immunisation is part of that. So which ones do you notify? So if it's a serious event, does it result in death? If it's life-threatening? requires hospitalisation, results in a persist, persistent or significant injury, then you do need to report it. Now, you don't need to report every fever or um, uh, vasovagal or um, injection site reaction. So you need to use uh, the, the immunisation handbook talks about your clinical acumen. Uh, so if it's serious or if it's something you just don't know. So someone comes back a week later and said, oh, doc, since I've had that vaccine, these things have happened. You're thinking, well, that's not related. But it is adverse event following immunisation. So if there's a temporal relationship, make sure you report it because we don't want to miss anything. We don't want misinformation out there and we don't want to add to people's fears of vaccines. We need to be looking after them. So let's look what happens when, if you report to us, we investigate it. Uh, now in the past, that system has probably been less than perfect, but we've really honed it during COVID thanks to Rebecca and Jody um, and others. So that's been a really good system and big shout out to um, Dr Rani Bhatia and Michael Boyle, immunologists to John Hunter have really helped us out uh, with very generous use of their time. So the TGA, um, let's have a look at what happens. So we know that um, very, very occasionally from uh, the United States and, and in Europe, uh, some young people can get inflammation of the heart, pericarditis or myocarditis after an mRNA vaccine. Exceedingly rare. You're looking at a handful every million doses. So what's the Australian data? So up to February... Uh, the 20th of February this year, the TGA's had about 3,600 reports from 3.4 million doses of Pfizer and Moderna given to 12 to 17-year-olds. In the 5 to 11-year-olds, um, up to that same date, the 20th of February, uh, just a week ago, they've had 715 reports from 1.1 million doses. So again, this is very, very rare. Uh, most common reactions reported were chest pain, vomiting, fever, fainting and headache. So obviously it's chest pain that you're interested in here. Those other things are not notifiable. Now, that from all those vaccines uh, in the 5 to 11-year-old age group, there were 10 reports of suspected myocarditis or pericarditis, and when they were investigated, they were found to be neither. Uh, there is one revaccination um, pericarditis that's being investigated. So from 1.1 million doses... Uh, there's only one possible uh, myocarditis or pericarditis. So if you're sitting with parents and they're worried, um, you can let them know that um, this is uh, reversible, spend a few days in hospital, it's not life-threatening, uh, it doesn't have long-term consequences and it's exceedingly rare. Uh, now, uh, in December, the um, Medicare have put on funding for uh, MRI to investigate uh, for children if they do have um, suspected myocarditis, pericarditis. Um, the, um, there's lots of misinformation. I saw something this morning someone sent me, the um, misinformation that the risk of death from the vaccine for children is 50 times greater than getting COVID for children, which is completely untrue. So let's look at the TGA data. The TGA have identified 11 reports from all ages, including children, where the cause of death was linked to the vaccination. From 769 reports of death following vaccination, they've been investigated and 11 have been linked to the vaccination. So those are 11 are eight cases of TTS, which we know from the um, AstraZeneca vaccine, very, very serious, and we tend not to use that vaccine now. You really want to be using the mRNA vaccines because they seem to be much safer with no TTS um, problems at all. Uh, two were linked to GBS, and we know that is a rare complication from some vaccines, um, and one from ITP. So there haven't been any children in Australia that have died after having a COVID vaccine. So if you see that misinformation or parents are coming to you with that misinformation, you can confidently say that's not true. So phase four monitoring, post-market monitoring, um, so the companies have to do it, but we also do it in public health. So we set up the Vax Tracker program. Uh, so this is me on... Um, 
well, we have, none of us have had much weekends in the last two years <laughs> during COVID, but uh, this is me is, um, uh, on the beach uh, between the flags. So we, on the beach, we know that we, if you swim between the flags, you're going to be safe. And it's the same with vaccines. We want to look after people and set up safety systems. So we've set up Vax Tracker. Now, we've had over 6 million people through um, the uh, Ausvac safety system that's uh, with Vax Tracker and another system from a GP in Perth called Alan Lieb, Smart Vax. That's 6 million uh, surveys we've sent out looking at vaccine safety after the uh, COVID vaccine. So we take vaccine safety really, really uh, seriously. So these are from the community. So they're not from doctors and nurses. So this is uh, completely transparent uh, looking at um, any adverse events after the vaccine. Uh, now, we are setting up a new system uh, soon where local practices, if you want to be involved, we can use a QR code. Your patients can QR code themselves into Vax Tracker, and I'll be sending out more information after that. I've got a few weeks off coming up after this, and then I'll send out some information if, if you want to be involved in that. We haven't been able to um, facilitate practices being involved um, uh, up till now. Um, so, so about some other vaccines, I'll talk quickly about Q Fever. We're getting a lot of calls about Q Fever at the moment. That website up the top, Q Fever Facts, is absolutely fantastic for uh, community and for uh, practices. So there's about 400 cases of Q Fever reported nationally um, every year and about 200 people are hospitalised. And Q Fever is very, very serious. It puts really big, robust farmers flat on their back, unable to run their farm. Uh, so this is really important to know about. So most of the vaccines that you order, the NIP vaccines that Jody was talking about that go in your fridge that you've controlled beautifully following all Chris's directions, um, come from the State Vaccine Centre. Q fever, however, is held by CSL. You deal with them directly. So this is not a vaccine that authorised nurse immunisers can give. A GP uh, will have to order it separately. So it, it, it's much more cost effective because you've got to do a skin prick test um, first, and also serology. So much more cost effective if you do it in batch lots. So some GPs do it regularly. So in Newcastle, there's some occupational practices uh, that do it. Um, further up the valley, obviously more GPs do it. Uh, so if you're not familiar with it, it may be easier to refer to a practice that does it all the time and can book people in. Uh, so it tends to be a rural occupational disease. So for farmers, shearers and abattoirs, and even uh, like a plumber that works in the abattoir, they need a Q fever vaccine. So it's a really unusual vaccine because most vaccines you can pump into people and, and, and there's not a problem. Q fever, if you, if you have the vaccine or have the disease in the past, then you have the vaccine again, it can cause a nasty necrosis. So we've got to make sure that doesn't happen. So when you go for the um, Q fever vaccine, you have a serology test and a skin test. Go back a week later, get that read. If they're both negative, proceed to have the vaccine. So do look at that website and contact CSL if you're interested. If you are getting patients, inquire, um, know about other practices that do it regularly and refer to them is probably the easiest thing to do. Uh, but a really serious rural disease, uh, completely unfunded. Um, if there was a disease down in Sydney making people crook, <laughs> probably wouldn't be unfunded, but because it's rural, it tends to be unfunded. So let's look at influenza. Um, so this is the wonderful flu tracking data from Dr Craig Dalton, uh, looking at about 60,000 people um, a week, uh, also now in New Zealand and in Hong Kong. Uh, this is data from uh, the last few years, uh, and we can really, this is just looking at cough and fever, and you can see the Omicron strike, sp spike there with um, uh, uh, respiratory symptoms reported. Uh, so at the top there is cough and fever, the five-year average, you can see the last few years because of social distancing and, and masks and, and lots of hand washing, we've seen less respiratory illnesses, syndromic respiratory illnesses. Um, but you can see on the bottom one there that influenza, the dark blue line, is the under fives. It, this is a disease of young children and older people, um, whereas COVID, thankfully, um, is not a disease of young children as much. Uh, so influenza, the, the uh, statistics each year is about 3,500 deaths, so it's a really serious disease, 18,000 hospitalisations and 300,000 GP consultations. So if you don't want your practice clogged up with people presenting with influenza, 
You want to get that vaccine out to people. Uh, this year, there's two new strains in the vaccine, uh, the Darwin and the Austria, I think. One B and one A are new. Uh, now, in COVID, of course, we talk about the spike protein. In influenza, we talked about the hemagglutin and the neurodimidase, and they're different uh, each year depending on the uh, strain that's predicted to, to come around the planet. Now, we don't know what will happen this year. Um, it could be a bad year because we haven't, uh, had much influenza in the last few years uh, and people are going to start to travel again, um, so we just don't know. So the funded vaccines this year, for children under six months, there's no vaccine available, strongly recommended for pregnant women, and then some of that protection will protect that baby in the first six months of life. Then from six months to five years, there's two brands available, Vaxigrip Tetra and Fluorex Tetra. Uh, now, it's the first year a child in that age group has the vaccine. Uh, they get two doses a month apart. If they've had the vaccine in previous years, just the one dose. Then for people from five years to 64 years, uh, there's three vaccines available, Vaxigrip Tetra, Fluorex Tetra and Alfuria Quad. Um, now, so a six-year-old will get the same as a 64-year-old. Now, for people 65 years and over, there's a special vaccine uh, that has a strong adjuvant in it, which means... I'm sure it's a very useful audience out there, you wouldn't know, but as you get older, your body doesn't work quite as well, your hair falls out, your knees get sore, and your immune system doesn't work quite as well. Uh, so that's stronger adjuvant for people over 65. Uh, so that's free and funded. So you really don't want your 65 and older patients going to the pharmacy, paying for a vaccine, because this vaccine's not available at the pharmacy. You really want them to have that vaccine, so let them know that that's available. So there's a stampede, of course, every year for ordering the um, influenza vaccines. Now, the website the, from the um, vaccine centre down in, which is a big warehouse down in Western Sydney, there's a pre-allocation for your practice there, and that will be available from Monday the 7th of March. Now, if you miss that, you can go online and place an ordinary order. Um, now, the day you get them, we don't know um, yet, so that... Uh, vaccination clinics should only be scheduled once the vaccines have been received. So you don't want to put a whole lot of extra staff on and, 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 and set up special influenza vaccine clinics because you don't know when these vaccines are going to come. Um, you'll only get uh, one order every four weeks. Um, but um, uh, have a look at that information there and that's on the um, vaccine ordering website. So just to quick bit about vaccine hesitancy and then we'll finish up. So even pre-pandemic, so in 2019, the World Health Organization looked at vaccine hesitancy as one of the 10 greatest threats uh, to global health. So vaccines can really solve the world's health problems in many, many ways. They're really simple to get out there. Even this morning, UNICEF was talking about getting vaccines into Ukraine, measles vaccines and even polio vaccines into Ukraine because obviously the health systems there are going to very sadly break down. So vaccines are just really important uh, in lots of different parts of health. But some people are really nervous about having vaccine. You would have heard the myth about the COVID vaccines. Oh, no, I don't want that vaccine because it's got a microchip in it. Now, I'm not sure, this is, this is um, uh, uh, unverified, but I'm, I'm, I'm suspicious that it came from this. This is from Scientific American. It's dated the 18th of December 2019, so uh, 11 days before um, COVID was first uh, uh, notified out of China. And it's this idea that uh, you put a little... Um, uh, microchip on your skin and then you can program that with your immunisation record. So this is like the AIR in miniature and then you can read that with a mobile phone. Now we might not need that in Merriweather but in North Africa where it's really hard to keep immunisation records and kids are in and out of camps and all that sort of stuff, this would absolutely be fantastic. Uh, but I think this was the genesis of that stupid microchip uh, myth. Um, so a lot of these things will start with something and, and then explode into something else. Um, so a uh, NGO um, called the Centre for Countering Digital Hate did uh, an examination um, of a lot of the misinformation about vaccines uh, in 2021. And they found that most of the information, 65% of the information, comes from only 12 people around the planet. So this is not widespread. So these people are professional misinformation people. So you'll often meet 
uh, your patients who are really worried about vaccines, but a lot of that information uh, is really coming from just one place so or 12 places. So it's not widespread, but people pick up this information. And people pick up information really easily. So um, there's this thing called heuristics, which means we pick up just a little bit of information and then we make it... Um, we, we make a determination, you know. I can see that tonight Charles has got his hair coloured and I think, oh, he's pretty funky, he's a pretty cool guy and all of a sudden I want to go out, you know, and, and hang out with Charles because maybe I, I can be as cool as that one day. Um, so that's, I don't really know Charles that well, but you just sort of make this simple judgement and people make these simple judgements about potentially life-threatening things like having a vaccine. So they see something about a vaccine, they think, oh, no, I don't want that vaccine. So they make heuristics because it's very complex. They can't read Scientific American and The Lancet, so it's very complex to make that decision. And that's where GPs, practice nurses, public health nurses, like down at the Hub and everywhere else around Hunter, New England, really providing that information is really, really important. So people make mental shortcuts to make rapid decisions, and we do that all the time. So Daniel Kahneman... Um, um, the uh, 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 author and investigator uh, about fast and slow thinking uh, was really start, started a lot of this sort of stuff and now can be uh, used to examine how people make decisions about vaccines. And people give extra weight to something if it's highly publicised. And they anticipate negative reactions. Oh, if I give my kid that vaccine, they're going to get crook. I, I won't be able to go to work. Oh, I'm not going to have the vaccine. And the, the, the things going wrong by doing nothing, it seemed to be preferable than things going wrong by doing something. So taking your kid out, going to the GP and getting a vaccine, if something went wrong, what if something went wrong? I'll be responsible. So those things are the things that people are making decisions. And as well as that, some vaccine hesitancy comes because of social exclusion, mistrust of government. If you look around the world at the countries that have had got really low vaccination rates, a lot of them are in the Balkan states where they've had a war recently and they have mistrust of government. Obviously, Ab Ab Aboriginal people in Australia don't have great reasons to trust government and their rates are a little bit lower. So trust is it. So good practice and trust with your patients and building up that rapport and giving people good information is just so important, and especially for marginalised people. Now, I've always thought in vaccine, gee, we just had a few people who dropped dead of an infectious disease. We could say, oh, here's the vaccine, you know, It'll be easy, but we've had so many people die of COVID and so many people who've chosen not to get vaccinated. Uh, these stories are, are a multitude. Uh, this is a particular one about five radio hosts in America and they were saying to their people on the radio, no, don't get vaccinated, it's nonsense, it's dangerous. Um, they all were spruiking anti-vaccination messages. All five decided not to get the vaccine. Four died in August last year and one died in September, all unvaccinated. And, and these stories around the world are quite common. Um, so I thought, you know, <laughs> we just had a few people that died. Um, everyone would line up for the vaccine, but it's not the case. These beliefs, so we're dealing with really strongly held beliefs, even though they're just heuristic and, and, and picked up very lightly. Um, so that, it's a complicated space we're working in, but good practice is really important. So... Um, people aren't going to come into your practice and have a vaccine and that level of trust that you need to get people to have a vaccine is not going to happen with dodgy practice. So that's what this is about. So for new nurses um, who've just done your vaccination certificate, there's a whole world out there. Um, there there's lots of um, opportunities, um, but you've got to keep up to date. For general practice, it's a really difficult gig. You've got to deal with every aspect of health, including vaccination, and now that's much more complex with COVID vaccination. And now we've got winter coming up with influenza vaccination. So the public health unit is here to support you and give you information. The website that Chris showed you has got lots and lots of information and, and where we um, um, try to answer people's calls. Uh, we prefer to give you the access to the information, but um, uh, please do ring if you need that support, um, either in, in a Hunter New England facility or, or in general practice or in anywhere else that you're working. And, and this is Chris's three beautiful grandkids after they went to the Belmont Hub and got vaccinated and they got a certificate and they're all pointing to a little Band-Aid on their arm. And that's a great outcome. And those kids are going to grow up happy and healthy because they're fully vaccinated and may it be the case for every kid in the world. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, do your best to look after each other. Keep vaccinating and, um, and, 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 and we'll just make the world the best place we can uh, with the tools we've got available. Thank you very much. Oh, we'll go to questions. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. That was amazing. 
I just wanted to go through, we've probably got about four questions. Yep. Have you seen any word about a combined COVID and flu vaccine? Uh, yes, there's, <coughs> there's a company, I forget which one, is working on that. Um, it certainly won't be available. Oh, Novavax is working on it. Thank you, Sharon. Um, phone a friend. <laughs> um, Novavax is working on it. Um, uh, yes, but definitely won't be available for this winter here in this country. Okay. And if I'm a happy, healthy 70-year-old person, I know Chris has pretty well covered this, and I've had a new, uh, Numavax 23 at 65, as was recommended, do I still need a Prevnar 13? Yes. And if I'm 75, because I missed it at 70? Yes. 90? Yes. Yep. So any age over 70, if I haven't had it, I need it. That's right. So they, both of those vaccines protect against the same bacteria, pneumococcus. The Prevnar 13 is a conjugated vaccine. It actually works a bit better than the uh, polysaccharide vaccine, even though it's got less um, uh, uh, strains it protects against. It's a better vaccine. And excitingly, there's a Prevnar 20 available yes. somewhere else in the world, not here yet. So eventually, Numavax 23 will disappear. That's right. So the new vaccines are really, really exciting. And again, mm. the anti-vaxxers say, oh, these vaccines came so quickly. <laughs> but it was actually 12 months between when COVID started and the first vaccines were given out and millions of people died in that time. So mm. it doesn't seem too quick to me. Mm. If I'm a happy, healthy Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander lady, can I have my Prevnar at 50? Yes, from 50 up, it's free and funded for Aboriginal people. Lovely. I've got new grandbabies... How often should I have my whooping cough booster? Oh, that is a oh, great that's question. That's a horrible question, Jodie. <laughs> the official recommendation is every 10 years. Yeah. So as opposed to mum that gets it every pregnancy, grandparents, dad, aunt and uncle, the Australian Immunisation Handbook recommends every 10 years. Mm. Now, if Nan was going adventure climbing in Thailand and it had been more than five years since her last tetanus vaccine, she would be recommended a diphtheria tetanus and pertussis booster then. But if it's just for the grandbabies, it's every 10 years. And can I use Novavax as a booster dose? No, mm. not at the moment. <laughs> so the only ones that are recommended for the booster dose are the Pfizer and the Moderna mRNA vaccines. Uh, so the other vaccines are recommended for the primary course, but not for the booster dose for COVID. Uh, Sharon just wanted me to note at this stage at the Belmont Hub, it really is just schools in the Newcastle area that can go and get um, caught up with their missed school vaccines. And don't hesitate to send your kids there because you guys are all super busy. But if you're a Maitland baby, we won't have your consent card at um, the Belmont Hub, unfortunately. But Sharon's taken it on notice to set up additional caption <laughs> clinics in her spare time. Now, um, Christine, there's so much love pouring out for you. <laughs> yes, thank she you, everyone. Amazing. It's been wonderful. Rightly so. I haven't cried. <laughs> um, any thoughts on education opportunities for our new ANIs? Um, so what we're saying, um, being an authorised nurse unioniser opens the doors to so many jobs. So look out and see what's available because... You know, GPs love to have their nurses as immunisers um, and community health in future. So you can look on the public health um, websites for, for jobs coming up for authorised nurses. But for education, um, there's the Masters of Public Health, if you want to be a Jody or Patrick one day. And... Always look for our webinars. But Patrick, I don't know, I, I do know actually, a lot of you guys would remember when we used to get out and about, Jodie and Patrick, myself and when Chris Carr used to do, used to get out and about and do face-to-face, -face, good old-fashioned old face-to-face education. So look for them in the future because I've told Patrick he has to get back out there and, um, you know, get up to Tenterfield and... Narrabri and all those wonderful places and go and talk to everyone. So look out for those. They were always advertised on our website and the Melbourne Vaccination Education Centre is, is a wonderful, wonderful one. They have um, virtual things every year and you can, um, yeah, 
um, always look on site for those. So, yeah, NCs has got lots of webinars, look on there. And we'll, we'll try to advertise those in our To The Point as well. Uh, so any op educational opportunities, we'll try and put them in to the point. If you know of everything, anything that's really good that you've come across, let us know and we'll share that as well, okay? So the Doherty Institute Vaccinology course is a, a natural progression after this. Um, just Google that and you'll find that it's a, quite a, a wonderful sort of segue into really uh, full-on course in immunology and okay. vaccinology sorry and what hunt new england central coast is looking at mm. hosting our immunization conference again this year covid willing but save the date for october the public health association is doing a combined immunization and communicable disease conference this year first time it's combined and that's in sydney so it's actually um doable to get to it's around a thousand dollars to go in person and about $400 to apply online. But I think that will be really exciting this year because we don't normally combine with our communicable diseases friends. There's some of the ideas that we came up with. That's excellent. And that, that's the bulk of the questions, Patrick, other than how can they have a cup of tea with Chris? And, and Julia. <laughs> and Julia. I'll give you Julia's email. L Loretta Baker, I, I'm sure you'll remember our wonderful Loretta Baker. Um, just message me and says, isn't it wonderful that Julia remembers how good you were with immunisation? That's right. <laughs> I think it's upon Thanks, Loretta. I'm sure she does. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'll just hand you back to Charles. Thank you, Patrick. I'd like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to all of our speakers tonight from the public health team. Um, you know, it's, it's always a pleasure to host you all and you're a wealth of knowledge, so we hope to have you back again soon. So, um, and of course, thank you for staying on with us. Um, you'll notice in the polls tab of Slido, I've now launched the evaluation survey for this evening. We really appreciate your feedback, so if you could please fill that out. Uh, for your certificate of attendance this evening, I will need you to fill that out. That's just how I'm able to accurately capture your information, and so I get that uh, certificate out to the correct email address. So. Please fill that out for us. We really appreciate it. Um, we are in early discussions of holding another immunisation update. So I'm going to have a chat with Patrick and the team um, in the next couple of months. We might, we're might we looking at holding this one during the day, though, so it will be an option for, the, for you, for those of you who um, may uh, want to watch an update during the day. But we'll promote all of this, so just keep an eye out through our email channels. Um, that's all from me. Uh, thanks again for, for joining us and we'll leave it there. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. <laughs>